Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks, Don, for that presentation. As Don mentioned, my name is Paula Garcia. I work as the admissions coordinator in the Florida campus in Jupiter, Florida. I'll be moderating the next uh, panel featuring uh, graduate program faculty members that are part of the admissions committee uh, for the graduate program. Um, so we'll be doing this for the next 30 minutes. I have several questions uh, based on topics uh, submitted by you guys online. Um, so before we start with the questions, so we'll go ahead and introduce each one of our uh, faculty members. We can start in the Florida campus. Uh, Dr. Laura Salt, if you'd like to share a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Laura Salt, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Immunology and Micro um, Microbiology. Um, I, I'm not sure how much we're supposed to share, but um, I, my work focuses on understanding uh, transcription factors in uh, TH17 cells and autoimmune diseases. Thank you. And Dr. Luke Weisman can go next. Sure. I'm Luke Wiseman. I'm a professor in the molecular medicine department on the California campus. I'm a chemical biologist and a cell biologist studying stress responsive signaling pathways. Mike, you might as well just go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm Mike Constantinides. Um, <clears throat> I'm an assistant professor on the California campus in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology. Um, my laboratory um, just started in February. Um, so we're just getting started, but we're looking at the um, responses of innate-like T cells to the microbiome and how the microbiome in turn modulates the development and function of the immune system. Great, thank you. So we'll start with the first question. This was a very uh, common question among the attendees. It's uh, what sets Scripps Research apart from other graduate program and other prestigious institutions? Who wants to take it? I mean, I can start, everyone can chime in, but I mean, I think that um, that's actually a really great question. But one of the things that I think sets us apart is the multidisciplinary aspect of our graduate program. The fact that, you know, students don't have like one set track that they need to stick to. Like for instance, when I was in graduate school, um, I was in, I'm an immunologist by trade. So I was, you know, I took all immunology courses. Like, and that, that was basically what I had to do. Um, whereas here you can come in and you can choose any course you want. Like if I want to take a structural biology course, I can. If I want to take an immunology course, I can take a neuroscience course. I mean, obviously you want to take courses that are like in line with what you plan to research, but I mean, you're not set in one particular track. And then on top of it, when it comes to your graduate work and your graduate thesis, they do encourage, like I said, this multidisciplinary ac uh, aspect of it. And so at least I have two graduate students who are doing a joint thesis between my lab and another lab on campus, which basically, which is a structural biology lab. So it really enhances this holistic like view of uh, understanding a lot or everything in, that, um, in terms of how you want to study your program of whatever it is you're particularly studying. So. That's in a nutshell. I was going to say, if I can add on top of that, I mean, every, everything Laura said is, is exactly how I view Scripps being different. And we're not the same um, because the graduate program encompasses synthetic organic chemists all the way up to organismal biologists um, for all the reasons she highlighted. But the other thing to also keep in mind is that when we have graduate student events like parties or, or happy hours or retreats, you're seeing everybody. And so you're all mixing together in the same place. And, you know, the collaborations that Laura was talking about those start typically at those sort of events where graduate students are talking to each other. And that sort of like mixing pot is, is just something that you just don't get everywhere. Um, and the lack of barriers we have really is what drives that. I completely agree with Laura and Luke. <clears throat> um, I'd also like to add that um, I think Scripps, in addition to being very interdisciplinary uh, and flexible, uh, you have the ability to take as almost as many courses or as few courses as you'd like. I mean, there is a, a sort of set requirement, but you can complete your course requirements within the first year, uh, which is not the case at many other programs. So you can accelerate, accelerate your research and completion of your PhD in, in comparison to those programs. Yeah, we want to get you in a lab working because that's where we think real, you know, the training happens. So even the courses themselves are geared around getting you more successful in the lab, which I think is really pretty exceptionally exciting. Great. For the next question, and perhaps each of you can give a factor here, uh, but the question is, what are the top three factors for a successful graduate school application to Scripps? 
Like, why don't you go first? Um, sure. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, I think the three. Should I give one or all three? <laughs> If, if you want to go with all three, sure, but, you know. We can um, for me, I would say uh, research experience is critical. Um, just seeing that you've had a chance to get into a lab and, and you understand what research involves. Um, and, you know, there are going to be highs and lows when it comes to research, but so long as you're motivated and you put in the effort, I think that really matters um, more so than results like a publication. Um, and then uh, for me, I would say, trying, making the most of your opportunities. Um, so, you know, taking those classes that challenge you, uh, that, you know, maybe are a little bit more difficult than the intro courses, but show that you've really grown and learned as a student. Um, and then um, I would say collaboration is really important as well. Uh, and that comes across from a mentor's letters um, and your abilities to work well with others. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with everything that Michael just said. Um, I, what was the question again? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. It's a, what are the top three factors for a successful graduate school application to scripts? Um, yeah, like I said, research experience, I definitely agree with. Because I mean, if you don't know what it's like to work in a lab, it's going to be a big wake up call when you go to graduate school. And it's not the time that you want to find out because you might be miserable and that's a lot of time and effort to put into it. Um, I think also at the application level when I'm reading them, I also really want to see that people when they're writing them that they understand the big picture of the research that they're working on. I mean, not that you're a glorified technician that you learned how to do all these different techniques, but that you really understand what it is you're doing in the lab and how this could impact science in general. That th That's important to me as well. I, I definitely agree on research experience. Uh, and, and the other thing I'll add to the other two is, is we want to see who you are, actually. Uh, in many ways, you know, it, it's easy to write down, I did these things. But like Laura said, show us how you thought about it. I mean, even if you're wrong, it failed. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, most of what we do fails, which is why getting in the lab is so important so you understand what that, what that actually means. Uh, I, I, but I think it's really important to make sure you come across. And, and I also think it's important to hide the fact that there is a formula. Like, we don't sit there and say, you know, you get you know, this many points for research, this many points for, I mean, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's the entire package that we look at. And, and you know, we, we look at the entire thing. So make sure you're being conscious and having people read all these different parts because we're looking at the totality of, of, of your application. And, and that really can vary depending on, for example, someone may have research experience, but they have, might, somebody else might have more, but we liked the way that the person that had less described themselves. It, it, it just always in. And so really be conscious of what you're writing and really, Show us who you are and what you what you want to be and what motivates you. Thank you. And I have a follow-up based on a, a key point that you all touched on, which was, you know, the experience in research. So is there any advice you would you give to a prospective graduate student who has had less exposure to research? Yeah, saw this one coming. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, real, the real challenge we face right now in many ways is the COVID-19 pandemic because it has kept a lot of people out of the lab. And, and this is something as an admissions committee we have to deal with in some ways, right? We're not going to see the same amount of research experience as we had a few years ago. But that being said, I, I think we all pretty much expect at least a year's worth of research experience somewhere. And if you don't have that experience yet, then take a year to go get that experience. Find a place, find a lab you can work in for a year and really gain it to get a sort of a better feel. It's like a lab. A lot of value in that actually there's a lot of value to figure out what type of work you wanted to do or maybe maybe like what type of science you're most excited about what really drives you um, but, but that being said you know i think it's really important that when you describe your research experience you are very clear about what, why why it happened and everything why you did it and everything like that as well as laura's point yeah i mean and just to no, no, touch on uh, Luke's point, yeah, COVID really was a doozy for everyone. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. But I mean, as Dawn mentioned in her uh, intro that, you know, we have a section for how COVID impacted you. And so COVID isn't an excuse for why you didn't do research. If there are ways to get around that. I mean, a lot of labs, or a lot of people did um, external research for lack of a better description. Like they did a lot of data analysis outside the lab for the potential labs. I mean, so don't use that as an excuse for not doing research. I mean, 
there are pretty savvy ways to get around and figure out how to do research if you're truly interested. Great, thank you. And for now, we'll, we're gonna be focusing on some of the um, application requirements that Don mentioned at the end of the presentation there. Uh, this one's related to the statement of purpose. The questions are, what makes the statement of purpose stand out? And what are the most common mistakes students make in their personal statement? Michael, it's your turn. <laughs> um, sure, I can chime in. Um, <clears throat> so I would say, uh, I'll start with the mistake. Um, so the most common mistake is essentially recapping your research statement. Uh, for me, I, I don't, you know, the research statement, delve into all the details about your research and your contributions and, you know, why your research is so exciting. Don't just rehash that in the statement of purpose. I think the statement of purpose should describe your motivation and who you are. Um, also describe, and I think that's the point, the, the place to address any adversity you've had to overcome, any dips in academic performance, things like that. Um, and also describe your interest in scripts specifically. You know, why are you applying? Why are you interested in our program? Um, yeah, just don't make it a carbon copy of the research statement, I think. I, I, I want to underline one thing you said that, that, you know, if you have a dip in performance somewhere, address it somewhere. Um, because while I agree that the biggest mistake is just rehashing your, your research, the other one that people often make is they just don't address big holes. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they're addressable. Like, you know, we understand having a rough year. We, we get that. And, and so, you know, but we don't like not knowing. And so that's a chance to really sort of tell us like a little bit about yourself and why there might have been a problem or, or something that, that, you know, and how you overcame it. Again, it's a chance to really talk about overcoming things. So I really think that's another thing to make sure you don't, don't miss an opportunity on. Yeah, um, I basically agree with everything that you said. Uh, actually, just like I said, the personal statement, um, as you know, Luke mentioned, that's really the time to let yourself shine and let us get to know you. Perfect. And at the other side of the coin, I know you mentioned a little bit about the research statement, uh, but what makes a strong research statement and what is a good balance for writing about what I have learned and what I have achieved? Um, I mean, I can just tackle this. So the research statement, like I said, and I, I touched upon this before, but we don't want to see that you're a glorified technician that, you know, I can do QPCR, I can do flow cytometry, I can do blah, blah, blah. That's great. I know we kind of expect that from people, but we want to see that, you know, how you applied it, how you applied it to your project, what you think that you know, it means into the big picture. And if you worked in multiple, so I've seen two different things. Like if you worked in like multiple labs, I've seen people touch upon little bits in each particular lab, which can work, but it doesn't necessarily allow you to get into the nitty gritty of what you did. So if you plan on doing that, really think about how you plan to focus what you wanna do, um, or you can just focus, if you did work, do multiple uh, research stints, you can maybe just focus on one or two that were the most meaningful and impactful to you and write in detail about those. And to go uh, off a little bit on, on that, um, a student asked, uh, can I write unpublished works or ongoing projects on research statements and are publications required for admissions to scripts? So I'll go. So, so the short answer is you can write about unpublished work. And, and quite honestly, we like to read about it. It's pretty exciting. I would make sure you get permission from your, your, your uh, PI first, though, um, just, to, just to make sure that there's no real issues there. Like, I don't know, some sort of IP issue or something. Just make sure you get permission. But uh, I, I think that's absolutely a lot. I, and I let students that have worked with me write about unpublished work all the time. Uh, the other side of that is, is a publication required? And the short answer is not necessarily. I mean, there are a lot of people that have publications, uh, but there's many that get into our program that don't. We're looking for thinkers, people that can really describe what they're doing. And if you can describe what you're doing, I mean, whether you're you know, fifth author on a, on a 20 author thing, or you can describe it well, we take to describe it well every time. So um, you know, publications definitely don't hurt, don't, don't misinterpret, uh, but we're looking for people that can actually think about the project and describe their part of that project. If I can add on, um, <clears throat> when it comes to unpublished work, um, certainly mention it in your research statement if, if your PI is okay with that. Um, you can add it to your CV as well as in press or in review, um, but I would also ask your PI to mention it in their letter. I think it carries a lot more weight if you can, if, if that letter can actually specify 
this publication is in review at this journal at this stage, and the you know applicant is this author position, um, because that we have some confirmation that you do in fact have a, a manuscript in in review. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, great. Um, another question here. I am very interested in working with a specific researcher's work. What is the best way to contact and connect with a faculty member that you wish to work with? Email them. <laughs> What'd you say, Luke? The email's nice. Yeah, I like to just email them. <laughs> I, I will make one point about that statement, though, specifically, is, is that when you pick grad schools, I'd be a little bit careful about picking a place where you only want to work for one person. Um, because what happens if you can't get in that lab or you realize it may not be the best environment for you? So, so I know when I looked at grad schools, uh, I imagine everybody's the same. I, I wanted to find a few people I could work with, like three or four that I felt good about their sign. There might be one that stands above, um, but I do think it's worth making sure, well, at least mentioning the point that going in wanting to work for one person is, is um, I guess, a little bit risky in, in some ways. I, I would make sure you want, like, like more than just one at a place, which shouldn't be a hard at a place like Scripps, if I just put a plug in. Uh, a, a bit of a follow-up question. Uh, are all graduate students' projects directly related to the projects or interests of their PI? And how often do undergraduate research topics carry over into a PhD project? Who wants to go? I can uh, start with that one. Um, so I, I personally don't have um, that much experience with, with you know, advising that many students, but I would say, um, if a, I have a couple of rotation students right now that have interests in the microbiome or innate like T cells, and we are devising projects that play to their strengths and their interests going forward. So they develop techniques, a familiarity with certain techniques as undergrads, and we're using that experience to launch their projects and accelerate those projects um, while they pick up additional techniques that will be complementary in the future. Um, so I think undergraduate research can certainly be built off of. If it's going to be something that's directly related to a topic that's unpublished, uh, of course, that would have to be a formal collaboration with their, their mentor from their undergraduate work. Um, but a continuation from something that's published is certainly doable. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, um, it's, I will say, though, you know, it is doable. I don't think it happens very often. It's not that common. It's more like you use techniques and sort of interest to help drive projects, like Michael was describing. Uh, the, the other thing I'll say too is that, that as far as projects being related to, say, my interests, for example, uh, they have to be at least tangentially related to my interests, right? I mean, my, my program is, is a certain type of program. We do a certain type of thing, and we have an area of biology we're interested in, but that area of biology is pretty big. And, and what has happened more often than not is that somebody comes in and they realize that they kind of want to be on the edge of one of our interests. And they realize that it overlaps with the project in another lab. And this is where you can get these sorts of uh, collaborations like Laura was describing, where there are more than one mentors involved, where you have two different labs coming together. And, and again, those driven by students are the ones that take us in interesting new directions and, and you know, keep everything kind of fresh and exciting. So that happens pretty frequently, actually. Um, so it's not impossible to sort of like have a project that sort of drifts away from the stuff that I'm, I'm most sort of uh, uh, um, known for and my program's about uh, to take us in, in new directions. Great, I have a, a couple of questions that seem a, a little bit more career oriented and they would like advice. So the number one would be if I turn to work in pharma for the next two to three years before starting a PhD program. What can I do to best prepare for script research? I mean, that, that, that's, that's, uh, it's, that's actually something we get a lot of, actually. We get a lot of applications from people coming from pharma. The thing I really want you to think about, though, when you do that is make sure you understand what you're doing. Like, make sure you understand the, the sort of the scope and the, the reason why you're doing experiments um, and, and, and when you're working in pharma. And th those are the ones that do really well when they describe their research in those sorts of environments. Uh, and in fact, like I said, we have a lot of people who do that to get the experience they need to get here. But we're looking for you to understand why you're doing something, not just that, as Laura put it, I, I do QPCR, is that right? Is that the technique? I do QPCR, <laughs> Western yeah. body. So um, I, 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 that's the one important thing you have to do. Make sure you know what you're doing and why you're doing yeah, if I could just add to that, um, I mean, from the immunology, advanced immunology class last year, we had a number of 
students that had been in pharma for a few years um, and they were excellent students. You know, they, they went to pharma, they had that experience and then they realized that they wanted to go back and really you know, increase that knowledge base by doing a PhD and, and doing original research. So um, it's certainly doable. It can add to their, uh, to your experience and give you a more maturity, a better idea of what you want to pursue. Um, and so I, I certainly encourage people, so long as, as, as Luke mentioned, you understand the research that you're doing in pharma and you can explain it. The only thing I might mention is that, you know, if you do go do research in pharma, then when you go to write about your research statement, you might be limited in what you can or cannot write about. That's the only thing I might, that might be a downside. But other than that, I see nothing wrong with doing research in pharma at all. That's one thing too, you could talk about with your boss going in, right. you know, after you get hired, you could say, you know, a couple of years, I'm thinking about going to grad school. Can I, what will I be able to talk about? What won't I? At least you'll kind of know when you move forward. Um, yeah, but that, that is something we have seen where they're, where they're restricted by confidentialities. And uh, another sort of a career oriented question. Uh, what is the difference in terms of career opportunities between having a PhD versus a master's? I think it depends on what you want to pursue. I mean, if you want to become a professor, you need a PhD for sure. Um, but if you want to go into like maybe public policy or something like that, I'm not sure that you absolutely need a PhD for that. I mean, granted, I don't know very much about public policy though, but um, I think it really depends upon what you want to pursue in the future to be perfectly honest. I mean, that, that's not really a question for us, right? Because we all stayed and got it. Got yeah. It. <laughs> right. right. Uh, I, I want to make the point that there are really good resources at Scripps and the postdoctoral services um, that, and, and graduate services that, that really provide a lot of insight into career development and career planning. Uh, and it's something that as PIs, as, as professors that mentor students, um, we all take responsibilities in making sure we're training our students to be what they want to be when they get done with the program. So, you know, how, how we work with somebody that might want to go to industry, their project might be sort of geared a little bit differently to get the experience they need versus someone who might go to academia. So, you know, when we know what you want to do, it's really something useful for us to help build our, build our sort of mentorship relationship around that um, to make sure you get what you need. Um, so at the, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's a little difficult to answer that question because um, we did change. Um, I do think PhD opens more doors. I think that's not surprising. Um, and I think in many ways, is the, the ceiling for having a PhD is higher than that for a master's in industry. Uh, although that doesn't mean that you can't achieve a lot of success and be really happy and excited with it with a with the position with a master's. Um, so I, I think it's just really determining, like Laura said, what you want to do and, and, and what you want to sort of uh, work on as you progress through. Great, thank you. And um, some students had mentioned or had several questions related to GPA. So in, just sort of in a broad sense, what are you looking at, you know, in, in terms of students, academic background, transcript, and, and GPA overall in terms of the uh, yeah. I can jump in. Um, so I would say, um, I don't think the committee has a cutoff for GPA. Um, so long as you can explain any dips in your academic performance in that, um, in that personal statement. Um, what I, I really like to see is progress. So I know a, you know a few students, our applicants will start off with a low GPA as they adjust to life in college and things like that and finding their, their path. Um, but if there's constant improvement, I think it's easy to overlook that initial freshman year where things just didn't turn out as you planned. Um, if, if you guys have anything to add to that. I think you described me. <laughs> I mean, but, but I, I, it's exactly right. Uh, and, and, you know, don't, don't leave it up for us to figure out why it happened. I mean, that, that's something Mike, Mike highlighted. I think Laura's highlighted. We all have kind of highlighted this. Ex explain it. I mean, there's going to be some explanation. Maybe it was you just didn't take college too seriously at the beginning. That's fine. I mean, you know, we get that. But, but we want to see the progress that shows that you've learned from that mistake and sort of uh, transitioned into to sort of a, 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 to be sort of more effective in your, in your learning. Yeah. Um, some, some other things that I've also, you know, talked with other people on the admissions committee about, 
um, you know, it, it depends on the, we, we look at the courses also. I mean, so if you're going into, if you want to get your PhD in chemistry and you're getting like all D's in organic chemistry and physical chemistry, that's going to be a problem for us, no matter what way you look at it. But I mean, if your GPA is low because, you know, all your science courses you did great in, but I mean, you got like a bad grade in basket weaving. I'm like, I'm probably going to ignore something like that because that's not really going to be that applicable <laughs> to what I, I'm really doing, you know, what I'm looking for, for a student in the lab. Like, unless I really feel that basket weaving is a necessary thing to do in the lab, I'm not going to worry about it. Don't, don't ask me to buy a basket and I won't call you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I want to reiterate too the idea that your application is really reviewed in its totality too. Uh, and, and so, so, you know, there are people who get in with low GPAs. They've compensated that by explaining them, showing that they can progress and learn, and usually with good research experience. And so, uh, you know, there, there are ways to sort of balance things out. And, I, I, and it's hard to give like a, a clear answer of this is what you need to get into scripts. Because you look at the entire package and you try to get an idea of the mindset of that person and ask, is this somebody that could be successful in our program? And so re there's not like one thing we look at. I mean, we, we read the whole thing. And, it's a lot of work. I mean, it really is. So, so you know, keep that in mind. We're not looking at just like sort of metrics, and then we, there's no triaging. We we read everything, and and it's a and it's a lot of work for the admissions committee. And so, yeah. you know, make it worth yeah, our while. Read something good. Look, I, I love reading your comments because they're very colorful. <laughs> like I'm not gonna lie, when I read your <laughs> your write ups from the applications. <laughs> It's a lot of work, though. I spend I spend basically I know. Christmas break doing this. I mean, it, but it, it's important work, and um, and you know, but like I said, we read everything. I mean, and, and yeah, now I'm all my comments. I got I got. Yeah, no, no, I, they're fantastic. They are fantastic comments, and like they're so much better than some of the ones that we get here, which are like a hey, yeah, you know, or just like great student. I mean, nothing. I'm like, this is really not helpful. <laughs> but, but yeah. That, that is an important consideration. We read everything. So make sure you're conscious of that. So for those students that um, uh, receive uh, an offer to be interviewed at one of the Scripps Research campuses, what is your advice to them to prepare for the interview again? I mean, go ahead, Laura. I was going to say, one, read up on professors and make sure that you can, you know, have some sort of intelligent conversation, like quasi-intelligent conversation with them about their project, and, I mean, for their research. Granted, it might not necessarily be what you're into, but um, I'd definitely say that. If you get, if you are interviewing with people who may or may not necessarily be on your list, do not, and I reiterate, do not tell the professor you don't understand why you're interviewing with them. That is a problem and it's probably gonna keep you out of getting into the graduate program. And I can tell you this because it has happened. Um, so like I said, just read up on the professors, read up on the program. Like I said, be able to have a conversation about your science. That's, and just and try to enjoy the weekend because we wanna see that you're a human being that you can you know, react normally and you're not gonna be some this odd person who is running around floating around the labs. <laughs> I'd like to second. Oh, uh, I was just going to second what Laura said. Um, so yeah, I, I think the key. What well, yeah, certainly you, you want to understand what your the PIs that you're going to be interviewing with are doing. Um, but what's even more important for me is understanding what you've done and explaining your interest in scripts because that's something that you can control. Um, so if if you can't in a five minute sort of pitch, uh, describe your experience, your, your research, what you wanna do, why you wanna do it at Scripps, that's a, a big red flag. If I can add one thing on too that Don's about to transition us to, uh, don't forget to, to engage the students here and really figure out what it's like to be a student at Scripps. Like it's your chance to like informally talk with students that are actually here doing work at the place you're thinking about coming to. And they're an enormous resource. They can tell you like what it's like to work in a lab. They can tell you what it's like to take classes. I mean, th they're the people in many ways can be more informative than the professors of talking about what it's like to be a student at Scripps because, well, I'm like, I mean, I went to Scripps, so I know what it's like to be <laughs> but, but others, others may not know. So the students are actually really fantastic resources and they're there to help you. And they recognize if you're, if you're not being, you know, a good person to the students, they know, and, and they will get back 
to us. So really take advantage of the students and really get a chance to interact with them as well, especially in the labs you're interested in. Sorry, Don. Paulo, can I just jump in? We yeah. moved past the research statement, but there was a really interesting question in the in the Q and A that I'd like to get the uh, committee's thoughts on. So, should data in the form of figures and diagrams be included in the research statement? How do you guys feel about seeing that data in this please, please, in the research statement? Please put it in there so I have something besides words to look at. I mean, I I, I think if you have a very well defined figure, it's a fantastic thing to put in. I mean, if you if you have, I mean, data itself is often not as not as good as you might like. But having a like well defined sort of figure describing your research, that's really helpful. When I read grants, I look for this. I mean, it's just really helpful to put things into context and and you know, but but do it well. I mean, you know, really take your time and make it. With raw data itself, you know, I've seen gels. I mean, I've seen I've seen what is it? I guess key PCR experiments so far. <laughs> I know I've seen. <laughs> But a good, well-defined sort of, this is the work I did, this is where my contribution was, that can go a long way, from my perspective. Yeah, I agree. Like, a nice schematic is, speaks a thousand words. Yeah. But make sure you explain what the data yeah. shows, if you're showing raw data. Um, if you just put the, you know, a graph up and there's no explanation, it's not going to help your application. No. And you'd be surprised by how many we see. We're just like, what is this? <laughs> Those are good bars. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much uh, to faculty members for uh, taking the time to answer these questions from prospective students. I will now throw it to Rosie and the student panel. Uh,